Good day, everyone. Good afternoon. Good uh, morning to everybody that has uh, connected. Uh, my name is Victor Diaz, and I'm the communications manager at the ECLT Foundation, and I'm delighted to be your host and moderator today. We would like to thank each and every one of you for your presence and your participation in this webinar. So today we're joined by distinguished uh, panelists from the International COCO Initiative and the Ministry of Public Service, Labor and Social Welfare of Zimbabwe, who will be sharing their insights and experience in setting up and implementing child labor monitoring and remediation systems in smallholder agriculture. Please note that there will be an, an interactive Q&A session at the end of each presentation by the Ministry and ICI, but you can also share your comments and questions in the chat box. And this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared um, uh, through social media um, after, after the, at the end of this week. So moving, moving towards the, the today's program, our presenters today will be Emmanuel Matsvaide from the um, Tobacco Industry and Marketing Board. He is the acting CEO. Uh, we'll be also hearing from um, Janive Delaveu. Uh, he's the head of programs at the, the International Cocoa Initiative, and he will be sharing with us some learnings from the cocoa sector in West Africa. Also, we'll be hearing from uh, Faith Ruramai Mambengere and Patience Rubinsai Rupende from the Department of, of Social Development of the Ministry of Public Service, Labor, Social Welfare uh, of Zimbabwe. And they'll be presenting uh, on their national case management system for welfare and protection of children of Zimbabwe. And finally, we'll uh, be hearing um, the key takeaways from the webinar and the way forward from Dr. Innocent Mwawa, the Executive Director at the ECT, ECLT Foundation. So Emmanuel, uh, could you please make some introductory remarks about today's discussion, if you are um, with us? Emmanuel, Sheila, can you hear us? Hi, Victor. Yes, Emmanuel is connected. Uh, he's coming shortly. Great, thank you. Sorry, guys, for this delay. Um, hopefully, uh, Emmanuel will be able to, to join us soon. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think connectivity challenges. He's actually connected and presenting in his office. I'm not sure what's happening, why we can't hear him. Let, let me try once more. Thank you. Otherwise, uh, maybe he can make his remarks uh, at the end as, as a conclusion for the, for the webinar, not to keep uh, people waiting. And maybe we can just move forward to ICI's presentation. So, Janiv, ICI's work is uh, impressive, and uh, we would like to um, hear more. Uh, so, could you please walk us through ICI's experience in implementing CRMRSs in uh, West Africa? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so just yes. waiting for the switch to happen. Is it all right? Yes, I can see it fine. Yes, okay. Um, so hello, uh, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting us to uh, this webinar. I quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jean-Yves Delaveu, so uh, clearly a really French name, uh, but I'm from Belgium. Um, I am an agricultural engineer. Uh, and after 15 years of working in various countries, mainly in West Africa and South America, I decided to settle in Switzerland. So I must say that I have no knowledge uh, whatsoever of the tobacco supply chain, nor of the child labor magnitude in Zimbabwe, but um, 
have a good grasp of the same topics in the cocoa sector in West Africa, which I'm going to, to present. So I've been working for more than five years at ICI, now as a head of program, supporting the cocoa and chocolate companies to develop and implement their sustainability strategies around child labor and forced labor, mainly through the CLMRS implementation. So CLMRS, I guess uh, you all know what it is, but I just explained first. It's a child labor monitoring and remediation systems, which I will um, show you and play a quick video to introduce how we implement such systems. Uh, but first, I'd like to briefly say a few words on um, what is ICI and why we are working around child labor and forced labor in West Africa specifically. So ICI stands for International Cocoa Initiative. Uh, we've been created 20 years ago. Uh, we are based in Switzerland, nonprofit uh, foundation, working with the cocoa and chocolate industry, civil society, farming communities, governments, international organizations, and donors. So uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives, and we are all working towards the elimination of child labor and forced labor in um, cocoa growing communities. For now, we have offices in addition to Switzerland in Côte d'Ivoire and in Ghana. Um, I guess you all know where it is, but the the dark green on the screen, uh, Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana, and uh, we aim to cover 100% of the cocoa supply chain with child labor and forced labor prevention and remediation systems by the end of 2026. But we are also looking for the scaling up of such systems in other countries in West Africa and beyond uh, in the cocoa sector. But because we don't want to do that alone, we also want to learn from other sectors facing the same issues, and uh, we want to share our learnings with them as well. So that's um, for ICI. Now, um, the question is, why do we focus on child labor and forced labor in the cocoa supply chain in West Africa? So I think I don't need to go back on the child labor issue at a global level. I think that we all know that uh, more than 160 million children have been estimated to be in child labor worldwide in 2020. Um, however, I just want to frame the discussions a little bit on our work at ICI and highlight that Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana alone account for more than 60% of the global um, cocoa production. One in three children living in cocoa growing areas is estimated to be uh, involved in child labor in those two countries. And 95% of these children are performing hazardous activities in the cocoa sector. Uh, but for the vast majority, more than 90% of the cases or 95, uh, it's within their own family unit. Uh, we also identify that forced labor is a risk uh, faced by the cocoa sector, but it's more localized and limited in scale. So I won't discuss it um, today. Um, before going any further, I'd like also to briefly show you the structure of the cocoa supply chain in these countries with a focus now on what's happening in the country. So it's in the yellow part of the illustration. Um, here I'll go with the graph on Côte d'Ivoire, but it's really similar for, for Ghana. So basically you have um, the farmers selling their beans either to cooperatives or to um, local tradents that we call pister in Côte d'Ivoire. Then the tradents can sell their cocoa to cooperatives or directly to companies in country uh, while the cooperatives are selling directly um, to the same companies. Then these companies can either export the beans outside of the country or uh, process it locally before exporting. So this is important to keep in mind when I'll show you how we design the CRMRS uh, in these countries, because the CRMRS agents, uh, monitoring agents are either located at the cooperative level or at company level. They are 
two different options and well others again but i'll just stand with those two main uh structure that that we see the blue section of this graph uh, shows how the legal environment in consuming countries can also impact uh, the implement the implementation of such systems and um, i'll show you now in the next slide how this legal environment looks like today so this graph presents um the different legislation that have passed over the last decade or so with on top you have a gray arrow with a time in the middle on top of this arrow you have all the formal legislation that have passed on human rights due diligence hrdd and at the bottom in orange you have the voluntary frameworks that are for the majority based on the ungp so the un guiding principle on business and human rights and on the oecd guiding principle for multinational enterprise so all in all we see that the legal environment has evolved and is asking now for all companies having business in various countries to analyze the human rights and environmental risks and take action where the risk is higher. In the cocoa sector, we uh, identify that the main risk around human rights has been identified is um, in West Africa, at the production level and around child labor and forced labor in a lesser extent. So I'd say that the, the main positive change for the implementation of child labor programs is that this expectation for responsible business conduct and human rights due diligence forces all actors to develop and implement such programs. So in order to respond to these um, different legislations, one of the most effective approach that we have identified and implemented over the last 10 years to address child labor in the cocoa supply chain is the setup and the running of child labor monitoring and remediation system CLMRS. Um, but yeah, how how can we say that the CLMRS addresses the UNGP and OECD guiding principle? First, uh, I just show here the approach presented in the OECD guidelines, where they illustrated the different steps uh, in one cycle which is split in six different elements. First, you need to have a system which is embedded in your system. This system needs to identify and assess the adverse impact and either take direct uh, action to remediate um, the adverse impact if needed or uh, seize, prevent or mitigate those uh, different impacts, track the implementation and the results and then communicate on how the impacts are um, addressed. So all these steps are also included in the CRMS, um, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But first, um, I understand that you are already familiar with the CRMS and their different functions, but I'd like to show you a quick animation that we produced at ICI, and that shows the different elements of such systems in our work. Then. I'll show you um, how it relates with the different steps of the OECD cycle. So we did some tests before. Uh, we couldn't manage with the sound. Uh, so I put a speaker on my mic. I hope you'll get the sound. Uh, and I'll uh, add the subtitles. It's automatic subtitles from um, YouTube. So there's one or two errors. But uh, at least you'll be able to follow up what, uh, what we see in the video. So I'll speak to you in two minutes. The International Cocoa Initiative's Child Labor Monitoring and Remediation System supports the cocoa sector to address child labor in supply chains. ICI partners with civil society, farming cooperatives, companies, and government to implement the CLMRS. Here's how it works. First, a community facilitator visits households and farms to raise awareness and identify child labor. The facilitators are trusted members of the community, often cocoa farmers themselves, who understand the local reality. If a child is identified as doing or having recently done... Oh, 
on hazardous tasks, the facilitator notes down the relevant information. ICI analyzes the information gathered and discusses with the local farming cooperative, company, and government representatives. Together, they develop targeted remediation activities to assist the children, households, or the community as a whole, depending on the problem. These activities are put in place and are aimed at getting children out of child labor and preventing future cases. Because the system actively helps farmers and their families, it keeps child labor visible encouraging farming households to declare the challenges they face and so allows them and others in their community to be assisted. The community facilitator then follows up with assisted children to make sure they don't take up hazardous work again and to identify where more remediation is needed. The Child Labor Monitoring and Remediation System, putting children's protection first in cocoa supply chains. I hope that you managed to get uh, to get that. Otherwise, I had some slides to um, show you afterwards if it was not working. But from that video, I'll assume that you've all uh, seen the video and understood what they said. Uh, we see that the CMRS follows an ongoing risk-based due diligence approach in line with the OECD guidance. Um, the CMRS is a mean of targeting the prevention, mitigation, and remediation assistance to children involved in child labor or at risk of child labor, as well as their families and communities. Um, the different steps that we've seen uh, in the OECD cycle are also uh, included in the CMRS. And so the CMRS response to, to the different steps of the OECD cycle, where we have the awareness raising, the case identification, the remediation support, and the, um, the follow-up of cases. So, the um, implementation of such systems have been proven to be effective. So there are just two numbers that I, I, I sorry, I'd like to show you here. Um, first, our analysis shows that one third of the cocoa supply chain in Cote d'Ivoire and in Ghana is covered by an effective CRMS, which is already, which is already um, give, us, give us a lot of um, valuable information uh, on the system, on how it's working, and in order to fine tune uh, the different elements. And um, after at least one year of implementation, around half of the children identified in child labor are not working at the last follow-up visit. And we've even seen that one child out of three identified in child labor are not working at the last two follow-up visits, meaning in our definition that they've been successfully removed uh, from child labor. So this means that um, child labor uh, are working and uh, that they are effective. Just a few numbers here to say that over the last decade, ICI supported about 200,000 children with prevention or remediation activity. And um, amongst these activities, we've seen that the most effective in terms of reducing child labor uh, have been the activities related to a combination of awareness raising and school support. So we've distributed um, 56,000 school kits to children in child labor or at risk of child labor. We supported more than 6,000 families in starting IGAs and VSLAs. And we helped more than 7,600 children um, go back to school, either formal school, bridging classes, or uh, apprenticeship. Um, we've also worked with the government to establish birth certificates to more than 12,000 children, giving them back an official identity and a means to continue their schooling as um, having such a document is a prerequisite to go from primary to secondary school. So um, we've learned, as I just said, that CMS are effective and impactful, but we never stop learning and um, we are constantly using the data that we have in order to improve the effectiveness of our support. So last year, we decided to take a step back. Well, not real. 
we continued implementing the system, but at the same time, we decided to have a deeper look at the, um, the results of the different systems that we are having. And um, we laid down the different results in a document called uh, CRMRS Effectiveness Review of Child Labor Monitoring and Remediation System, which is um, available on, a, on a, our website, or we can send it uh, by email afterwards. And the aim of that study was to understand what works best and improve the performance of the system. Uh, we use the data from the CMRS implemented in the cocoa sector in Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana, but also case studies from the tobacco sector. So in the end, we gathered data on more than 200,000 children and wondered which element allows the CMRS to identify child labor effectively and which support have the biggest impact on the child labor status of the children. On the first point, the effectiveness of the CMRS, we noted that we identify more children in child labor when the monitoring happens during or just after school holidays and peak season. So based on that, this means that we need either a constant monitoring throughout the year or a monitoring which focus on uh, these two specific periods of time. Um, we've seen also that the status and the competencies of the monitoring, monitoring agents have an importance. Um, we've seen that the monitoring is, when the monitoring is done by women, the child labor identification, identification rate is higher. Um, the same if the monitoring agents have a higher level of education and um, the monitoring is more regular and sustainable if the agents are paid. When the system is based on voluntary principles, uh, the monitoring will happen for the first two or three years, but then um, they will stop. So these different elements need to be included in the recruitment process and in the process from the companies themselves. Finally, uh, we also see that child labor rate identified through CMRS is slightly lower than the one coming from National Prevalence Survey by about 30 to 40 percent. So, but at least um, the system manages to identify child labor cases and act on it, which is not necessarily the case of other certification or sustainability programs. So. We have some explanation about these facts. And the main one is that we are working in a structured supply chain with farmers who have been trained and are better off than um, the rest of the, well, the other farmers from the country. But um, there might be other, other elements of explanation and we are still assessing any other reason that could explain this lower identification rate. Now, on the effectiveness of the different support provided through the CMRS, we note that um, the children are not working, are not in child labor throughout the year. Their participation um, changes, fluctuates over the time uh, during the year. So you can go and see that the child is not working, but a few months later, you might uh, start working again. This means that in order to ensure that what we did had an impact on the life of those children, we need an ongoing monitoring and support. Um, also, the follow-up visit, those regular follow-up visits are essential in order to understand the changes and the impact in the life of the children. So if we do regular monitoring visits, a follow-up visit of the children to which we provided the support, uh, we can assess the changes in their status. So, in the systems that we implement in the cocoa sector in West Africa, we recommend to, uh, once a child is identified in child labor, we do a follow-up visit every six months and assessing what happened during uh, that gap. And we do that until the child says that he's not involved in child labor during two consecutive follow-up visits. And then we can say that uh, we had an impact and the child has been taken out of child labor. Um, the aim of the support that we provide is to address child labor, but we've seen also that the systems are effective in improving uh, the access to other rights as well. As I said just before, we um, 
provided birth certificates to 12,000 children. So now those children have access to an official identity, but it also opens access to different programs offered by the government, like including the schooling. And on the schooling, we've seen that um, through the serial race, out of all the children identified in child labor at the next the first follow-up visit that we conducted six months after we've seen that already uh, almost 20 percent of those children uh, restarted uh, their schooling which is quite positive as we see a direct link between uh, schooling and uh, child labor um, we also see that the system well, as I mentioned before, uh, results in the reduction, one child out of two is not involved in child labor at the last follow-up visit, and 30% of the children are not in child labor at the last, at the yeah, two most recent follow-up visit, which means in our definition that the child is, has been taken out of child labor. So we see good results, we see that it's working, but uh, the CMS alone won't solve the problem. Uh, different actors need to use the, um, the data from the CRMRS and the different insight uh, that we have to develop their activities. For example, we've seen in, um, in Côte d'Ivoire that the use of agrochemicals is something in which the children are uh, quite often uh, involved. So we, as ICI, with the remediation, a part of raising awareness or setting up community service group to help the farmers, we can't do much, but the companies themselves uh, can include, for example, in their good uh, agricultural good practice program, more focus on the um, pesticide spraying, on the need of children to be out of uh, the farms when uh, the adults are spraying, etc. Et so the data from the CMS need to be used by um, the, the, the different uh, sustainability programs and other uh, productivity programs from the companies and also by the government. With this data, the government can also develop their own national program and um, they will be also involved that they have a part to play in the implementation of any support that we want to, to provide uh, through the remediation and uh, yeah, companies or even actors, different actors can maybe refer the case to the government uh, for them to, to act and to take action. So now, um, in my view, all that is great, uh, but the CMS uh, implementation has a cost, financially speaking, but also in terms of staffing resources, because you need to have um, monitoring agents going from farms to farms, family to family, asking questions in order to identify the child labor cases. So we tried to see if we could identify the most at-risk household in a way to target the monitoring efforts to these household and um, identify faster the children in child labor or at risk of child labor in order to provide support to these children their communities or, or their, their household faster as well. Now in Côte d'Ivoire and in Ghana, we know uh, that all child labor cases in the cocoa sector are concentrated in 60% of the cocoa farming household. So if we could identify and target this household, it would be uh, more cost and time effective. So in order to do so, what we did is that we collected data on farmers and on their children, identifying the children in child labor or not. Then um, we developed a data-driven model, which would, what this means that we would find a correlation between specific um, predictors at household level and actual child labor cases. So it's data-driven because it means that it identifies a correlation but not a causality. Uh, so, so we did that in order to identify the household the most at risk and prioritize them um, for monitoring and support. Our analysis showed that with a subset of just 10 basic KPIs available at household level, it is possible to predict child labor with a precision exceeding 90% and up to 95%. Hence, that means that we can reduce the number of households that need to be monitored by, like I said, almost 50, more 40%. Um, but in order 
to have such prediction rate, we need to have the data on the children themselves, which often lacks uh, in the member registry of the cooperative or the data of the companies. Uh, and But we just need three basic information on the children, which is their age, their sex, and uh, their schooling status. And for the... Um, for the system and the model to be working uh, with great accuracy. Uh, we also need to have the data as precise as possible. Uh, otherwise, yeah, bad data in, bad data out. So um, that means that the capacity building of the enumerators is key in the CMRS implementation. So uh, I think I stopped there. Uh, there are many other learnings that we have, uh, but yeah, clearly we won't have enough time, uh, even if we discuss during all day, um, to go through all of them. I hope at least that uh, I've already given you some ideas on what we need and why we need a CMRS and what we need in the CMRS to say that we have yeah uh, a system which is uh, effective and efficient. On which element uh, should the CMRS be able to report? which elements need to be analyzed to improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of, uh, of CMRS and um, how risk modeling could help improve the targeting of the monitoring and the support. So as I said before, you can go on our website and uh, we have a section called Knowledge Hub and you will find all the reports uh, on these findings and even more. Uh, we decided to put them all in open access uh, so that all learning can benefit other sectors and other actors as well. Uh, we can also send you uh, any document by email if need be. So uh, if you have any specific questions on the CMRS implementation modalities, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to, happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janiv. Uh, it was very insightful. Uh, um, as I said before, I, I really believe that ICI has done a, a very impressive and insightful job in the past 20 years, uh, trying to eliminate child labor and, and identify uh, uh, child labor in, in COCO. Uh, I, I'm really impressed by the predictability of, uh, of child labor. And uh, that means that you, you are doing the, the right things to, to move forward and to remediate and monitor child labor in, in the field. So I really appreciate that. Um, so to all the participants, uh, we have a, a few minutes to, to answer your questions. So feel free to, to reach out to Janiv if you have question now, questions now. So I see that there are a few people with, the, um, with their hands up. Yeah, I see some questions in, in the chat that okay. I, can, I can take if you want uh, yes, in the ahead. order that I see them. So the first one is from Agostina Ottaviano. What indicators are used during the visit to conclude that the child is not working anymore? So that's uh, a good question. Um, it's the same question that we ask. We try to have uh, a form which is uh, standardized and as short as possible. So the enumerators, we don't ask the enumerators to have a high level of knowledge, uh, even if we see that the higher the level of knowledge is, the higher uh, the prevalence rate, well, the higher they identify uh, children in child labor. So we have basically, because child labor in Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana in the cocoa sector is really focused on hazardous child labor. We just took 95% of the children in child labor are uh, involved in hazardous tasks. We listed the, the, the 12 or 13 different hazardous tasks uh, which have been uh, set out in the, um, listed in the, um, in the decrees and in the laws of those two countries because this is hazardous child labor is uh, conditional versus formal child labor. So this means that it depends on the laws of the country. So the list is somehow different, but we have an overlap of 70 or 80% of the hazardous tasks, the same in the cocoa sector in both countries. So we ask the same question and we ask if the child has been involved in any hazardous task. Uh, at the first visit, when we first meet the child, we, we ask him ever or in the last 12 months. And then when we do the follow-up visit, if we identify the child, is in child labor because he says, yes, I'm doing one of those hazardous tasks. Then we have the follow-up visit where we 
get more granular information on the on the child uh, schooling status if he's living with his parents if he's happy with that if he's working uh, because he's, he wants to etc and we also uh, again ask the same question if he has been involved he, he they be involved in hazardous child labor since the last visit and because we do a visit every six months we have an idea of what he has what what kind of hazardous activities has been done over the six month period every time and if a child say uh, that they don't they haven't been involved in any hazardous task in the last six months then we say okay you haven't been uh, in child labor in the last six months and the next visit if again he says I haven't been working the last six months we have covered a, a period of time of 12 months and we can say that the child is out of child labor but yeah maybe we are aiming too far, but this is the definition uh, that that we are using. Um, I, we hope that uh, that answers your question, Agustina. Maybe we can hear. I see that some people have uh, raised their hands. Um, uh, maybe I can let you talk and ask your question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that presentation. It was very insightful. Um, and of course, I, I recognize uh, the point that was raised in the video that child labor becomes more visible because there's remediation. So I guess families are more motivated to come out and be honest. My question is on the monitoring agents. You highlighted that you identify higher numbers of children in labor when the monitoring agents are women, have you done any further investigation into why this is? And my second question is also um, on the system itself. Uh, I'm assuming this is a digitalized system. Does the government have access to it? Um, uh, I'm sure that would be a very expensive undertaking. Um, but yeah, is, is the government linked to this system? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, good questions. Uh, so for the female monitoring agents, um, this is first what we saw from the data, and now we are um, analyzing, understanding why this situation. So we've done uh, first, the, yeah, the first was based on the data. Now we are doing qualitative research and asking more and more uh, children and monitoring agent and parents to understand why uh why we have higher um identification rate when it's women and it's still ongoing the the, the survey and the study uh but basically it's because uh children are more prone to confide in uh in the in a woman so they, they, they come out with the, their problem more easily it seems uh then when we conduct the visit the monitoring agent needs to go a little bit on the side with the child still uh, under the supervision of the adults they they need to see each other uh, but we feel that the parents also trust more uh, this process if it's done with a woman so meaning they trust their child to be with a woman a few meters uh, out, out of their no no not of their, their side but uh, 10 meters away from them to discuss with a woman more than uh, with a man so those are basically just the thing that come out more is that they trust more a woman to come out with their with their problems. So we are still learning, uh, trying to understand because there are some challenges as well for women to be a uh, monitoring agent because that means that they need to go, they need to travel with motorbike uh, in the different farms. Um, some farmers don't need don't don't like being interviewed by women so there's a lot of other challenges that need to be addressed but um yeah we are definitely working on that uh in addition because just it gives like role model for the young women uh one, young um, girls in the communities if they see that women can come and have an active part in the in the process in in the life of their villages they they might be yeah role model for them um on the app, yes, we developed an app, uh, and more and more companies are also developing their own uh, suite of application and dashboard to uh, implement their own CMRS. The one that we have uh, 
well, we, we give it uh, free access to our members as well. Um, good question with the involvement of, of the government. For now, we feel that uh, the government doesn't have the, not the technical, but the financial capacities to implement the CMS. And we don't think that the added value of the, of the government would be in the monitoring of the children themselves. So um, we prefer the, the, the government to play a, a role of coordination of the different activities implemented by the different companies, because it's uh, mandatory for the companies to have similar systems in their own supply chain. So anyway, something will happen. So it doesn't really make sense for the government to try to fill in the gap. Uh, the companies and the private sector will do that by themselves. And so we see the role of the government more in a, in a central place where they could gather the data from all the different actors and take their own decision, take their, uh, yeah, make their own plans and own, own program based on this and coordinate, play a coordination role. Um, we're also trying to involve more the government in the um, implementation of the remediation. So uh, referring systematically the cases, specific cases to specific national services that are there and uh, uh, that can provide any support directly to the children. Voilà. Um, any of the other questions that you would like to, to answer, uh, jean -Yves? I haven't read all of them because I see there are more and more coming. Yeah. Um, so I see a question on the duration of the CRM race in the in the supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. So, well, I won't read the full question, but basically is that. So there are two things. Um, I don't know exactly how to uh, understand that question. First, the CRM race is a system that needs to be there and be there for for long i'd say not forever but as long as there's child labor you need to to have a system in place so basically if you start the same race you have the same race uh if the 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 risk of child labor decreases and if you have a risk-based model this means that your model will be running and giving you less and less uh household at risk of child labor, so less work to do. And potentially some at some point will yeah go be below a certain threshold where you can maybe stop and um, have the government take over with national services with the grievance mechanism. This is something on which we are working a lot also is trying to set up a grievance mechanism in the communities. Uh, so the, the different actors can have uh, children but also adults, neighbors can have access and uh, and and report any yes, yeah, well, no, I won't say suspicious cases, but the cases of child labor or things uh, problems in that that they can see. So the series is there, yeah, uh, for a long time. Um, but if the question of the CMS implementation is about from the beginning, uh, when you start visiting a household and when you stop. Uh, visiting that, that household, it all depends. If you identify a child in child labor, then you start to take action and to have that uh, cycle of different follow-up visits every six months until you manage to get the children out of child labor. And so it can take uh, one year or it can take three, four, five years. What we've seen is that usually it takes three years to, to take a child out of child labor. Uh, because it's a change the family has to adapt. Uh, there's uh, some changes that need to happen at the household level. Um, and then we have some cases, we have a few cases in our database where we see that whichever action that we are taking, the child still is in child labor. So that means that the problem is deeper and that the CDMS alone can't, can't solve the problem. This is what I was saying before. Uh, and yeah, so it's... Uh, it's yeah quite variable, but I'd say that over three years you can have a big impact in one community, one household, and this has been also proven by um, a survey paid by the government, uh, the United States Department of Labor uh, through NORC, the University of Chicago, where they had a look at the inter interventions that the, the sector, the private sector, uh, did in the communities over a period of four years. And they've seen that a mix of CMS and community development had had an impact and a decrease of 30% in the um, 
child labor prevalence rate in these communities over a period of four years. So uh, I feel it's pretty, pretty good already. Great. So I suggest that maybe the, the written questions, uh, you can go through them, uh, Janiv, later on, and yeah. that we give a priority to the people who have uh, risen their hand. Yes, I'll type answers. Yes, now or after the, because I like to listen what the, the others yeah. have to say. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Shumba Sibangani, can you hear us? Yes, I hope right. you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I want to start by saying thank you very much for this uh, a uh, brilliant presentation on a model that to me uh, seems to really be working. Obviously, um, I, I think it would do obviously with a few touches here and there as you uh, acknowledge yourself. I had two questions which I was uh, trying to throw into the, uh, the box. Um, um, one of them is to do with uh, the remediation focus on the children in child labor. I think one would obviously be curious that much as we want to focus on the children, what happens to the perpetrators in the first instance who bring these children into child labor? Does the system identify these? And where are these issues referred to? That is one of my questions. The other question is to do with the uh, children are taken out of child labor and uh, part of the remediation process is taking them into school, which I think is great. Uh, just trying to understand, are there any cases of relapses? Children who have been withdrawn, taken to school, and maybe a few months later found back in child labor uh, does the system detect this and how does this you know reconcile with the whole issue of um the root cause because the the the, 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 the children getting back into child labor might suggest that there's a deeper underlying cause other than just getting into child labor thank you yeah thank you um, so on the first questions about the remediation focused on the children and what about the perpetrators, um, we have to uh, keep in mind that in that specific sector of the cocoa sector in West Africa, 95% of the children are in child labor in their own family. So the perpetrator of the, well, it's the parents and if they're uh, taking the children on uh, their farms, it's just because they don't have any other means or because they don't know that the activity that the child is doing is hazardous because some activities are permitted. So meaning the children can be on the farm and they can do some light work, uh, specific, specific light work activities that are listed in the decrees of uh, both countries, but maybe they just yeah, don't know that uh, carrying heavy loads is uh, is bad for your back. Maybe they don't know that uh, a spraying pesticide has a long-term effect and it's just not that you have a headache for two days and then it's it's over so a big part of the of the support and the remediation that we provide is around awareness raising we've seen that just by raising awareness in the household and in the communities you can also already have a, a pretty good impact um, but obviously that's often not enough because the root cause, you mentioned the root cause afterwards, the root cause of child labor in the cocoa sector there is poverty and lack of access to um, social services like schools, but also health facilities. So um, there to address this, we have also activities that we uh, carry out for the communities or for the household, um, like the VSLAs, the, Village Save and Loaning uh, Loan Association. I guess you all know that uh, as well. Um, in order for the families to have, yeah, to increase their their revenue, um, and this is what I was saying. Also, the CMS data first. Companies would rely on the CMS on the ICI to solve the problem alone, but now 
we've seen that we can't do that just with remediation activity. So the lack of resource or uh, the lack of access to schools means that this information goes back to the government or to the companies and they can decide to um, fill a gap. Maybe there's no schools in one area. So if there's no schools, the parents won't leave the children in their house when they are going to the farms. They will pick up their children and the children want to do uh, the same activities as their parents. So they will end up in hazardous activities, doing hazardous activities. So they can decide to build school. Uh, we can decide to have a bridging class so we can put back children to school to the good uh, level. Maybe even if they are 10 years old, they can uh, start uh, to go to school. Um, but also, for example, we have one of uh, our member, uh, which is Nestle, and they decided to invest 1.5 billion um, Swiss franc, it's basically the same as euro or dollars, in order to improve the revenue of the farmers by providing a cash transfer to the farmers if they uh, comply with some specific um, recommendation that they have, like the pruning of the, the trees, putting their children back to school, having women uh, involved in BSLAs, etc, etc. So it's not alone. So that's basically for the remediation. Now, for the 5% of the children who are not working for their uh, families, and they may be, they, they are in most danger. There we can speak about a perpetrator. So we have specific indicators in the question that we ask uh, in the follow-up visit. When I say that we take granular information, we ask questions like, do you live with your parents? Are you in contact with your parents? Uh, did you agree with the decision of living with these people? Do you agree to work? And so we have five, six, seven, I don't remember, specific questions that uh, allows us to have a red alert. And then we have um, protection, child protection specialists that are there that can take then um, over the, um, the management of those specific cases, but they're really a fraction. And furthermore, we are working in the structured supply chain, which has been uh, under certification uh, scheme for years. So we don't see that much that sort of firm. We have some cases during the year, but then the child labor specialists go there, uh, not child labor, uh, child protection specialists go there and ask questions more to understand and then works with the government to see how we can handle the case in order um, yeah, to remediate the, the situation of the child. Um, then yes, the, the, the relapse of the children, uh, yes, it exists. Um, that's why we follow up the children until the point where they are not in child labor anymore with our methodology of two consecutive visits covering 12 months of monitoring and then when we stop this follow-up, that doesn't mean that we stop any uh, follow-up activities or monitoring activities of those children. That just means that they go back in the uh, standard cycle where you do um, household and farm visit once a year just to see that everything is in order. And if you have a risk-based model, then it can also change some of the factors of the risk model and, um, and change. But that doesn't mean that we stop uh the process there that just means that from a closer monitoring we go back to the normal cycle of monitoring thank you Janiv. being conscious of time uh maybe we can make uh we can have one more uh oral question and then uh if the answer can be a little bit short that, that would be great so we can move forward to the next presentation so francis can you please share your question Okay, thank you so much. I think you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I mind is, is similar to what he was just explained in terms of uh, monitoring issues. To say when you are going out for uh, monitoring, just to find out if children are waking or not, or if the children are waking and in what type of environment, like hazardous or non hazardous. Uh, what I would want to understand is. Uh, the remediation system, which is, is which is used to make sure that these children are indeed withdrawn from child labor and placed back to school, who are the key actors in in, in terms of uh, offering the remediation system? Is it only the project itself, or there are other actors outside the project who are also taking part 
in terms of care, taking care of these children who are withdrawn from, from child labor. And the, uh, in terms of, I mean, in terms of making sure that the, these children are frequently monitored, whether they are in class or not, how, 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 how frequent is it? Is it monthly, is it weekly, or at what pace is the monitoring done? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Francis, for your question. It seems like uh, Janif uh, got disconnected somehow. So I'll share with him uh, your question. And for the other people who have uh, raised their hands, uh, maybe you can share the questions on the on the chat box. And then, oh, he's back. Um, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, I no don't see cuts as well in, in my zone. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, so Francis was just sharing a question that, that I was saying that I, I can share with you uh, uh, by by hand or I can write it to you so we can move forward with with the rest of the presentations. But thank you so much, uh, Jani. Thank you for the invite. Well, it was a pleasure. So uh, let's continue. Uh, with the presentation, now I give the floor to Faith Ruramai Mavengere and Patience Rumbitsai Rupende from the Department of Social Development of the Ministry of Public Service, Labor and Social Welfare of Zimbabwe. They're going to share with us um, their insights from their National Case Management Initiative in Zimbabwe. Patience, Faith. The floor is yours. Ladies, can you hear hello us? And, um, yes. yes, hello uh, and good day. How are you? Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, can anyone hear me before I proceed? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. I will start with the presentation and hand over to my colleague. Perfect. Okay, so my name is uh, Patience Rimbidai Rupende from the Ministry of Public Service, Labor and Social Welfare, and as already uh, outlined, I will be presenting on the National Case Management System for the Protection and Welfare of Children in Zimbabwe. So um, I'll start by just uh, I think preempting the presentation, looking at how the case management system is among the various and critical efforts that the government of Zimbabwe is implementing in eliminating um, the worst forms of child labor amongst other child protection concerns. And um, we are doing this through the implementation of the, uh, of the case management system. So our presentation outline looks um, like this. Uh, we'll have the overview of the system and we'll also have the system coordination structure, the system process flow, linkages with other programs and the opportunities. So we can go to the overview of the system. And whilst I wait for that slide, what I'll also just want to say that within the case management system, this is a system that actually acknowledges that children are indeed exposed to various forms of labor and other forms of violence against children. And it's very important for us to appreciate that child labor in it in most instances is a symptom of um, you know, the actual pr uh, uh, problems and other factors that might be pushing or pulling children into engaging in child labor. So going to the first slide, the case management system um, delivers child-focused, family-centered interventions that seek to improve well-being and mitigate the impact of various social ills. So one thing to take note of um, within the case management system is that it not only focuses on the child, but understands that the child is coming from a family and there is need for us to strengthen this family um, and even the house, including the household economy to ensure that um, the child receives a comprehensive care. And also it um, harnesses a multi-sectoral approach which thrives on a clear referral pathway. So this means that um, the work that is being done um, and when we implement child protection within this framework, we actually have a standardized referral pathway which allows us to know who is doing what and where at any point in time so that um, when a case has to be referred to a specific stakeholder or a partner, it's, uh, it's very clear. And uh, we also have a feedback mechanism which provides for comprehensive service provision. Um, with regards to, to the system, we're not only focusing on response, but we also um, work on prevention. 
uh, initiatives that come um, in the form of raising awareness, parenting initiatives, and we also have also the uh, economic uh, strengthening acti uh, activities and programs, as well as early warning systems and um, violence against children screening, uh, which allow for us to prevent uh, you know, various forms of abuse and um, various forms of uh, child labor from actually um, emanating or children engaging in, in such activities. And then um, we also have the resp a response mechanism um, which allows for timely case identification uh, because we believe that um, once a case is identified, uh, response has to be done within uh, given time frames, which also are provided for within the framework. There's also follow up and management um, of the cases up to uh, a point of resolution. So in this instance, when a child, uh, when a case is identified, there has to be uh, referred within the referral pathway that I mentioned earlier. And um, in addition to that, a child is walked with throughout the whole the whole way. Um, this, the various actors that are involved ensure that a child's case um, is dealt with until it has been resolved and it's not left hanging. So there are various ways that the ministry and its various partners uh, do this to ensure that um, follow-ups are made and management continues up to when we feel that the child can actually be, um, wh whereby we feel we can say that the case of the child has been resolved. And uh, we also have specialist service provision in the form of HIV and disability sensitive programming, because we understand that um, in our various communities, children are exposed, um, as, as some children are exposed to HIV and um, some, we also deal with children with disabilities. So we, we have elements within the system that try to, you know, that are very inclusive to ensure that no child is left behind and all children are included in the program and um, they receive specialist services that speak to their specific situation. And then we also have family and community strengthening. Like I mentioned earlier, it's very critical that we assist the child within their family environment, which is a more natural environment for them. So this includes ensuring that um, the child is involved in all, um, during all the steps that we take and uh, during the whole process. And we also try to support and build on the resilience and the potential uh, for the growth and development, which are inherent in each individual and in each family, because um, each person does have capacities to be able to deal with the various uh, situations that they're facing. And then just to also reiterate, the case management system does not only focus on the presenting problems, but on all the assessed needs of a child. I will get into the various process flows that we have and uh, discuss uh, this when I get to that part. And it also aims to ensure that, um, you know, through coordinated collaborative care, children receive the services they need in a timely manner. I'm sure we can all agree that um, children who are exposed or engaged in child labor need to benefit from a protective and rights-based <laughs> environment and also to access um, services so that they, and also ensuring that access to, they also have access to national child protection systems and to basic social services, uh, such as education and health, which is why we, we, we also implement the case management system in Zimbabwe. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So what we are looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is a pictorial view of the case management coordinating structure. I alluded in the last slide that um, you know we the system harnesses upon multi-sectoral uh, coordination so this is the structure that we um, that guides our work so as you can see we have uh, service provision levels at community level um, so the system not only operates at higher levels but the system is actually engraved and um, also depends upon uh, upon the community level where we also have various actors coming in which I'll discuss in my next slide and we also have the district level right up to provincial and national level. And at the national level, um, this is where we have our legislation and policy guidelines. And uh, this is where we also see um, uh, policy and legislation being developed for, to guide implementation. So the case management system, again, um, harnesses its strengths on being guided by uh, various pieces of legislation and policy in the country. I can give an example of the Children's Act in, uh, to, to, to that regard. And um, you, as you can see from the structure, we also have um, multi-sectoral actors that, are, that we work with as, a, as, as government with the Department of Social Development playing the coordinated role. And we also have various levels, as I mentioned, 
Um, and you see from that, uh, that service provision is mostly done at community and um, district level. We also have, um, you know, just looking at the structure, key strengths that we uh, focus on and that we get from that uh, structure, it um, incorporates all state, we have state actors, we have um, civil society organizations, the private sector, so everyone is involved in, within the case management system structures, and you'll find that the levels also feed into each other, um, top, uh, from bottom up and top down, um, depending on the need. And then also that um, from that structure, you'll find that at service provision level, we have uh, community surveillance through our CCWs, which are our community child case care workers, as well as our child protection committees at all levels. Thank you. Next slide. So within um, the case management system, there's a process flow. Um, besides the fact that there's a structure that we have in place. So the process flow is a standardized uh, flow that um, guides how we implement um, once a case has been identified. It guides us, this is uh, similar to, also similar to the referral pathway, but this is more of a service provision flow. So you'll find that we start with the case identification. And case identification, uh, linking with the above structure, um, it actually takes place normally at uh, community level. Um, where a child can actually, you know, identify that they are maybe after community awareness that they're in a, in a situation that requires um, support or assistance and they actually present themselves and make a report to the, uh, to the officials that are, um, to the relevant authorities. And we also have the community child care workers, the CCWs who are also at community level. Community um, members can also identify cases as well as stakeholders. So the, the system pretty much allows for anyone who is at community level and at any level really to identify a case and refer it to the, um, to the requisite authorities. And then this uh, flows into the intake, which can be done at community level by our CCWs and um, the social development officers who are at district level. And then we also have the case assessment. Now um, with the case assessment, this is a statutory mandate. And um, this is done by social development officers that are within, that are uh, employed within the Department of Social Development. And uh, the assessment process, I won't get into much detail, but um, just to say that this is a process that allows for us to identify the various needs of the child beyond the symptomatic problem that the child is presented before the authorities. So you'll find that um, I mentioned earlier that um, a child who is identified engaging in child labor might actually be, um, this might actually just be a symptom of the actual problem that the child um, actually, th that has uh, forced the child into engaging in child labor. And then this flows into care planning and care planning now is a collaborative process, um, which is uh, done together with uh, the, the family and the child. And again, um, a care planning is done by social development officers. And um, a care plan actually outlines the various steps that are going to be taken to ensure that the child is protected and um, that the child does not uh, go back into the, the, the into engaging into child labor, for example. And so the, this care planning is very, is one of the critical stages that we have. And um, the care plan now has to be implemented once um, it has been agreed upon. So you'll find that the child themselves also participate in this process whereby they also identify um, how they would also want to be assisted. And um, this is also, uh, put in writing and um, allows everyone involved to, to take part. As well, we also have family conferences where if we feel the family it does not um, it requires information or requires to be strengthened in terms of understanding the detriments of child labor to the well-being of the child, a family case conference can be held and that will also lead into the development of uh, the care plan. Then we also have implementation whereby the department now, this is where the multi-sectoral element also comes into trust. We've got various partners that we work with in the private and um, the, the government, uh, in, in the non-governmental sectors. And this is where we come in to work together to make sure that whatever care plan has been um, identified and um, uh, developed for the child is then implemented. So you'll find that um, 
for the various actors that we have, we might have actors that are in education. This is when they're now engaged to ensure that whatever plan is now implemented. And then we also have uh, moved to the case review whereby social development officers, the family and the child also participate in this. So um, during the review, a care plan can actually be reviewed and um, revised, and we can actually end up having a different care plan from the initial one, depending on new developments or on uh, new needs that might arise um, within the child's family. This, uh, we then move on to case resolution. Uh, case resolution now, this is when we, we feel um, after um, all the assessments have been done, we have constantly been reviewing, after follow-ups have been made, we feel that you know, this, uh, this, the child's needs have been met at least three to four needs of that child have to be met before we can say that we have resolved a case, um, especially a protection case. And um, as you can see, the case closure and, and case, case transfer, that one um, is not really linked to the case flow because we rarely close case, uh, cases. We focus on resolution. And with resolution, this means that the child's case remains open for review at any given point in time. And we also allow after re resolution that we continue to follow up on the child and their family to ensure that uh, all their needs are continuously being met. Thank you. So from this uh, slide, this is another pictorial view of um, the comprehensive services that are provided within the case management system. And these are what we call linkages within the system. So you find that within the system itself, um, we've got various actors, number one, that come in to provide all these services that are within the system. And um, these, we, we also, the partners also come in to meet and coordinate the various activities that they're doing through uh, child protection committee platforms from community level right up to the provincial and national level. And you'll find that uh, we've got various um, uh, services that a child receives. And we also focus on making sure that we layer as many services that a child requires. As, um, as I said earlier, the, a child engaging in child labor is pretty much a symptom of, uh, of another problem or a bigger problem that has to be solved. So within the case management system, we look at all these elements and we try to address them is um, part of the process of implementing the various care plan in mind as we identify needs for, for, for the child. Thank you. So um, this is where I leave um, my colleague Faith to finish off the presentation and uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Patience, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, taking on to what Patience was discussing, I'll look into the opportunities that exist we, within the system in Zimbabwe and um, opportunities for collaboration uh, among stakeholders between government and the private sector. So key to note is that we do have the operational framework that is in place. Patients uh, talked about the coordination structure in detail, as well as um, an overview of the case management system. So the case management system, it's um, a key component of the National Action Plan on Orphans and Other Vulnerable Children. That, that's the overarching framework for child protection, uh, prevention and response in the country. So um, currently it's under, under review and uh, key to note is that child labor is a key thematic area of focus in this uh, successor program uh, that is being developed. So that's a key opportunity that, that is there because there is uh, a, a, a framework in place to guide um, implementation of, of programs prevention and response in the in light of child labor. And um, as uh, patients highlighted, uh, key to the case management system, central is the community workforce, uh, community child care workers. So these conduct community surveillance uh, in communities. So having that workforce in place um, strengthens the issue of identification of cases as well as um, the issue of 
preventing through um, preventing child labor and other instances of abuse through awareness raising in the in the communities so um, we we are looking at strengthening safe and confidential reporting because we noted that um in zimbabwe like uh as was uh, presented in Cote d'Ivoire, the statistics that we that, that we have, uh, our system has lower identification rates than the national surveys that are conducted. So um, it, it, it points to uh, a need to strengthen identification of such cases. And that also speaks to the need for strengthening the, the capacity of the workforce uh, relating to the CCWs and also the social development officers who are the frontline workers um, in the districts as already alluded to by, by patients. So um, strengthening their capacity through trainings and also provision of um, tools of trade. Uh, CCWs are very key um, in case identification and also at intake stage. Currently, uh, the prevailing situation is that most of the case intake, it's being done by the social development officers at district level. Um, we have developed an app, a virtual referral desk, and we, all, we have also developed an MIS for the case management system. So the virtual referral desk, um, it's utilized by the community workforce. Uh, when they identify cases, they then log into the app and um, log in details, which are key and pertinent for the intake process. So if that is uh, strengthened and also scaled up, we operationalize to full scale the virtual referral disk. That will also mean that um, we have uh, limited the, the workload of the social development officers. If the cases are, are in the intake, um, it is conducted at community level, and then the, the, the virtual referral desk feeds into the MIS uh, directly into the intake stage. And also, uh, there's a need to strengthen the referral pathway and also collaboration, mainly uh, between the, the labor workforce and also the protection workforce. So uh, in Zimbabwe, we have a department that looks into um, labor, labor relations issues. And we also have um, a department, the Department of Social Development, which is responsible for child protection. So strengthen collaboration between uh, these two departments as well as the stakeholders who are working uh, in these sectors. Uh, who actually will actually um, bring more results. And um, I've talked about scaling up of the MIS. Currently, the MIS is operational in 32 out of uh, 65 districts, which is a coverage of 49%. So if we scale up the MIS uh, to, to all the districts, um, that will also en enhance uh, effectiveness and efficiency in, in our um, programming. And uh, speaking to collaboration between um, labor and protection, we also uh, look at the interoperability of the labor MIS and the case management uh, MIS. We do have the National Social Protection Policy Framework uh, with uh, wraparound social protection programs, um, which are detailed in the next slide. I'll just run through the um, social protection programs. Um, patients has already alluded to the linkages within the system. So um, it's the, the provision of uh, other social protection programs to identified children um, and also their families. We have a harmonized social case transfer program um, to strengthen household the household economies. And we also have a food deficit mitigation program um, focusing on addressing food insecurity. We have a basic education assistance module that, that, that looks at uh, provision of um, educational support 
to identify uh, children in need. And um, beyond just school enrollment, we, we, we track uh, school retention. So the BIM is there to make sure that um, vulnerable children are enrolled in school and also are retained uh, in, in, in school. And um, we have support to persons with disabilities. Um, and also we have a public assistance program in sustainable life loads for the families. And also um, we, we have um, a dedicated department that's looking into instances of drug and substance abuse um, mitigation. And uh, we have also noted that the, the, there is a close linkage between uh, abuse of drugs and substances and also child labor. So that, that's why we are um, focusing on drug and substance abuse mitigation as well. And we also have support to asylum seekers, refugees, and returnees. And that also includes um, support for children on the move. Next slide. We have also noted that um, there's a need to strengthen evidence generation to inform our um, strategies for preventing and responding to, to child labor, to, to really understand the extent of child labor uh, across the different sectors and the interconnections um, with the other forms of um, violence against uh, children. And um, also just to note that um, the anecdotal evidence here in Zimbabwe points to the a high prevalence of child labor in the informal sector. So the, there's really need for us to strengthen evidence generation in that area so that we really inform our prevention and response strategies. And um, talking about public-private partnerships, um, we are looking at the establishment of a sector-wide fund for child protection. Um, this year, we have conducted in collaboration with other development partners, uh, the ministry has conducted a um, high-level dialogue on child protection financing so that we look into the strategies of how we can make sure that we, in, we increase financing of child protection programs, mainly from the national budget. And um, the opportunity lies in the Child Welfare Fund that is established by the Children's Act uh, under Section 75H. And um, this fund is open to public uh, private partnerships, uh, investments uh, towards child protection, uh, prevention and response. So, and we noted that uh, if there is any injection of funds from uh, the private sector, particularly for child labor prevention and response, these funds, uh, there's an opportunity to ring fence the funds for um, child labor prevention and, and, and response. Okay, thank you. I think that that marks the end of our presentation. Thank you, thank you. Together we can end child labor. Thank you. Over to you, yes. Thank you very much, Faith and Patience, for this insightful presentation on the national case management systems in Zimbabwe. So uh, for all the participants, if you have any questions to Faith and Patience, please raise your hands. Um, or share the questions on the on the chat box. There is a question to patients asking uh, to please expand a little on household income strengthening initiatives. And uh, we have Eddie one yes. there raising his hand. Yes, patients, can you hear us? Yes, I can, I can. Uh, may I go uh, on and proceed? 
Yes, go, go ahead. Okay. Um, so in terms of the households uh, strengthening in economic activities, we have various, um, we have some within the government system and we also have some that uh, our partners are implementing uh, from their various ends. So within the government system, uh, Faith already alluded to examples of the harmonized social case transfer. We also have um, the FDMS. So the government also recently launched the sustainable livelihoods projects in various communities, and we're hoping that we can expand across the country. So the idea is we want to strengthen the household to be able to take care of their own to take care of their children so that they have no needs to end up um, going out to engage in child labor. Then you also have partners that are in, engaging in um, income generating uh, projects, and then you also have partners who um, uh, who are also implementing ISOs, which are um, um, programs that also assist the parents to take part in savings and um, livelihoods projects within their various communities. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Great. Thank you. Eddie, uh, the floor is yours for your question. Eddie, can you hear us? You are muted and we- Okay. There you go. It's okay now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Eddie Wabeo. I work with the Elimination of Child Labor and Agriculture here in Uganda. Uh, I would like to know how the PPP, that is the Public-Private Partnership, works, where you are talking about establishment of um, a sector-wide fund on child protection. Um, I would like to know how you are um, uh, going about it, how... Um, it works because in Uganda we we we, we have um, a similar venture, but um, the, 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 you find that the private sector is a bit re reluctant to contribute. So, like in case of uh, Zimbabwe, what motivates the private sector to contribute resources towards child protection? Unlike here, where they talk of um, social responsibility, where they talk of paying taxes to government. So um, that's the clarity that I needed from you. I thank you. Thank you, Ari. Patience, uh, Faith? Perhaps we can have more questions That's while. Oh. Can you hear us, Faith? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear? Yes. Can me? Yes, okay. we can. So, okay, thank you. So I was just um, saying, um, public-private partnerships are in, in in two forms currently. We, we have the one that I've presented on um, the Child Welfare Fund, which is statutory and um, legislated through the Children's Act. Um, the Child Welfare Fund is currently uh, just receiving funds from, from the national budget, from the national fiscals. Uh, at the moment, we do not have any private players or the private sector contributing to the Child Welfare Fund. And uh, probably this is because uh, of a uh, lack of information on, on, on the fund and also the opportunity to ring fence uh, the funds so that they are only used for the purpose of um, the, the specific purpose of the program. The other form that I did not talk about is the, um, uh, what we have, uh, what we know is the Child Protection Fund. So this is the pool of um, funds by the development partners that are being managed by UNICEF. 
uh, on behalf of government. So we are implementing the programs and uh, UNICEF is um, a, a fund manager as well. So it provides the, the financial support as well as the technical uh, support in, in program implementation. So um, I, I'm not sure about um, the laws and policies in Uganda, but um, uh, the, this, this is what is prevailing in, in Zimbabwe. And maybe you can take it forward or you can also share lessons with us on uh, what has worked well in that regard in, in Uganda. But I think um, we, we have the same challenges as you have uh, indicated it. Thank you, over. Great, thank you very much, uh, Faith. And we have one last question from Francis. Thank you so much, I think you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, my question goes to the, the presenter. I think it's a very good presentation, but I just want to understand uh, the, 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 the um, social protection uh, measures that they are put in place. I think one of the issues that we should uh, think of is about this, uh, the social protection uh, programs which are put in place to assist both vulnerable uh, in terms of children and the rest of the society. I don't know in Zimbabwe, any, any programs on social protection that are targeting the, the children to protect them from, uh, from the uh, shocks uh, that uh, that that can happen to push them into into child labor. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation, um, Victor. If you can beam our presentation, especially on the on the slide with social protection programs. Yes. So uh, these are some of the social protection programs that are there, uh, they are not all, they are more. So these are some of the key social protection programs that are there to strengthen the economies of the household and uh, prevent children from uh, engaging in, in, in labor and also to support children and families who they've been identified. I don't know if you want me to go into detail and explaining the slide once more. I think that that should be okay. Uh, but if uh, if there are further questions uh, after the webinar, we're going to send uh, documents, and people will be able to respond to the panelists. So if there are further questions in that sense, uh, I invite the participants to share them by email uh, and to respond to to the email that we're going to send after the webinar. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just to indicate that. Um... Now we are, we are we have moved a step forward as, as government um, in, in social protection programming. We are now looking at shock responsive social protection programming going forward. I, I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you, Ova. Great, thank you very much. Now being conscious of time, we're going to give the floor to uh, Innocent Mwawa, the executive director of the ECLC Foundation. To, he's going to share the takeaways uh, and the way forward uh, after these two very insightful presentations. So, uh, Innocent, over to you. Do you want to share your screen? Yes, I'll share my screen. I have the difficult task of trying to summarize what was a very eloquent uh, presentations by um, a very distinguished panel, but um, I'll try. Um, what can we learn from what uh, we have been, uh, okay. What can we learn from what has been said and what, how would we carry this uh, task forward uh, if we look, we're trying to look ahead? I think from the presentation of ICI, um, Let me handle my screen here, I think. Uh, okay, from the presentation by ICI, I think it was, there were four takeaways that I could, uh, uh, when I was listening to them, uh, to Jonius intently. Number one, that CLMS is a very essential tool if you want to meet the requirements of the 
human rights uh, due diligence requirements, which are getting more and more strict, which are getting more and more uh, mandatory. Uh, it, it is a tool for the operationalization of the UN guiding principles and the OECD governance uh, uh, guidance. Secondly, I think uh, he highlighted that uh, the gender of the monitor and the education level of the monitor is important, but also is remuneration. That systems that rely on volunteers, you get poor quality data and also the commitment is not always there. So um, it, it's, it's a useful thing to keep at the back of our minds. And that using risk models based on uh, relationships that they've seen between child labor incidents and certain characteristics of children and families, it just helps to strengthen the, um, uh, the efficiency of the child labor monitoring system. But I think the most important part, if I was uh, to summarize it, was that CLMS is not everything. It doesn't replace what government needs to do. It doesn't replace what uh, companies need to do, but it strengthens what companies are doing. It strengthens what government should do in order to uh, address the root causes of child labor. From the Department of Social, uh, uh, Social Development, I had three takeaways. I know on my screen there's just two, but it's okay. And the, the main uh, takeaway was one that there is a national case uh, management system in place. It is community-based, it is uh, comprehensive, it's interministerial, um, and it is really focused on strengthening the family unit. Yeah, but that within that, there's also rooms for private sector participation. Then, of course, we heard about all the social protection uh, programs that I that are in place. But when you look at the process flow and uh, try to look ahead, you ask yourself, what are the gaps and opportunities that we can see? Uh, I think at the community level, we saw that uh, there is the need to incentivize uh, the, the, commu the community care workers, uh, providing them transport, uh, because uh, normally the what distances at a wide, I know they are, are very long. And of course, um, um, uh, uh, leveraging di uh, di digital technologies. At the intake level, we also don't have a social worker at the ward level. The social worker is only at the district level. And you can imagine in a district, if the social worker is to be dealing with all cases, the workload can be quite uh, heavy. So what can we do going forward um, in, in this kind of um, environment? In, in the case of Zimbabwe, if we try to implement a CLMS in Zimbabwe, what could this pilot look like? So from an ECLT perspective, we see uh, we have three principles. Number one, in implementing the CLMS, we cannot ignore government because some of the biggest challenges that we face in the countryside where most of the agriculture happens in Africa, uh, is particularly in Zimbabwe, it is really just that those far, far communities, far to reach communities, they cannot access government services. Distances are long and the government resources to reach all households are difficult, but we cannot replace government because uh, it has a certain mandate and we need to have government on the table if we were to um, make progress on this. Number three, number two is that uh, the duty to uh, respect human rights is a responsibility of the companies. And uh, even if ECLT was going to come and participate, even if an NGO was going to participate, that does not replace the individual uh, company's responsibility and actions to deal with child labor and their supply chains. And while we are talking about remediation, I think the most important part is to know, to keep in the back of our minds that prevention is better than cure. We should work to ensure that children don't go into child labor in the first place. With that in mind, I 
was looking at what has been presented by ICI, which is primarily a private sector system, to what we uh, was presented by the Ministry of Labor, which is really a pi public sector system, and wondering to what extent can we merge this system so that government and the business are actually working together to protect children at the community level in the Zimbabwe environment. So when I look at the systems that are in place, those things that are in blue are things that already exist. For example, we know that companies at a community level, the tobacco companies, they already have leaf technicians. The government has already told us that the uh, government uh, a, a child labor protection committee at the world level. They have a district uh, social work, social worker whom they call the social development worker. TIMB, we know that they already have a sustainability team. We also know that at the district level, there's a, a district labor officer. So, so what is in blue is already in existence. But what we need to do is to come up with the green things in order to strengthen. That is number one for TIMB to go in there and take care of the uncontracted growers because the companies take care of the contracted growers. TIMB and the farmers associations, the national employment councils and so forth to take care of uh, child labor in the uncontracted growers. Then they refer those children to the government committee and the government committee, the prog a program could potentially pay a community care worker because we were told that they need to be paid in order for it to be sustainable. That's what we learned from ICI. Then at the ward level, make sure that there's always a social worker so that the community worker and the social worker are working together at the community level. Then the cases are referred to the district social worker for legal reasons, uh, I think there's, there's certain powers which the state, the state says they can, only the qualified social worker can handle. The word social worker can be a student of social work who is doing internship or something like that. So there's room there for, to, for further discussion. But after the cases have been reported to the district social worker, how, how does remediation happen? I think a possibility is there to engage an NGO, which is going to provide all the remediation of the cases that have been referred, which is able to coordinate with government agencies, with all the social protection programs that we have had, but also um, uh, school enrollment, uh, birth certificates, and whatever else is needed uh, for, for remediation. But most importantly, especially for uh, management of the funds and coordinating this whole initiative at a district level. Then lastly, of course, is the, the reporting which uh, needs to go to the district level office, which needs also to go to the government and of course the, the TIMB. I think what is important to note is that at the NGO level there, there is also a possibility to uh, set up operational grievance mechanism so that there are possibilities for in a district for all the um, uh, all, uh, grievances to be reported uh, to the NGO and fed back uh, backwards to the companies and TIMB as needed. So this is just a initial ideas of what this could look like, of how we could mobilize the knowledge that we've gained today into programs and actions and that are informed by the experience of others that are informed by government systems that are already in place to protect children in areas where tobacco is grown in Zimbabwe. So if we were to do a pilot, what could be the three areas uh, it could focus on? Number one, I think, is the, to focus on strengthening the identification, child labor identification, referral, and monitoring at community level, which would include training of uh, the child protection committees, the care workers, uh, uh, extension workers, companies, and government extension workers, and also making sure that this process is uh, digitalized for ease of reporting 
and uh, capturing of data, child profiles, and so forth. Provision of transport uh, to uh, the uh, care workers, uh, including the uh, social worker at the world levels. Provision of uh, incentives uh, for the um, care workers and the, uh, the social worker. And of course, awareness raising. The second pillar could also look at um, improving children's access to remediation services. So supporting the district child labor committee, supporting the NGO that will be doing the remediation, uh, making sure that uh, everyone who is uh, referring children to this uh, referral network, is they are common indicators, there's uh, quality control, there's monitoring and follow-up, but also uh, of course, the operational grievance mechanism. Then lastly, to work also at national level to strengthen that institutional framework coordination and reporting. That includes working on the um, uh, national action plan that is indicated by the ministry, also working with the uh, government, especially the ministry, the labor department uh, to set up a child labor unit convening the national steering committee and using the data that is emanating are from the first and second pillars to make decision to scale up this, uh, these initiatives nationwide and bring other crops also to play their part in uh, dealing with the issue of child labor, which we know just doesn't exist uh, in tobacco or agriculture alone, but is quite rampant across uh, uh, many sectors of the Zimbabwe economy, if, uh, including mining, sugar, and um, um, of course, domestic work and uh, uh, other parts of the informal economy, uh, as we might already know. So the reason why I'm throwing uh, this is to already plant the idea uh, to begin the process of consultation. These are just conversation starters, ideas on what can we learn from what is happen what's happening in COCO? What can we learn from what is happening in government? And how can a future program supported by ECLT using the resources uh, of companies on the ground, using the resources of government on the ground, how can ECLT collaborate with the Zimbabwe stakeholders to strengthen child labor um, uh, remediation and monitoring in areas where tobacco is grown? Uh, so in more to come, we will come back to you for more ideas on this. But uh, I, for, uh, for me listening to this uh, webinar, I think the important, important thing is it is possible, it can be done, but we need government, we need the private sector, and uh, we need to be working together in order to uh, provide holistic protection to children. Thank you, Victor. That's all I can say in terms of summarizing the presentations uh, this afternoon. Great. Thank you very much, Innocent. And thanks everyone again for the presentation. Thank you, Janiv. Thank you, Fra uh, Faith and Patience. Uh, thanks all the participants. Um, uh, we run out of time a little bit, but um, it was a very insightful discussion. And um, thanks everyone for the for your questions. And as I said before, we will be sharing documents and links. Uh, in a follow-up email, and uh, we would like to 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 learn from your perspective as well, and to to if you can complete uh, a survey, that would be great. Um, thanks again for your presence. Thanks everyone, and uh, I hope to see you very soon. Bye bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>